Thank you for that earlier introduction, Francis, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries of the Republic of Korea for inviting me to speak here today. No talk about navigation in a digital world would be complete without a mention of e-navigation. One of the stated aims of e-navigation when we started off this endeavor about 16 years ago was to bring together new and existing navigational aids in a holistic manner. That is to move from something like what you see on the screen to a future state which could look something like what you're seeing on the screen. And as the work on e-navigation got underway at the IMO, IMO settled on a definition. I'll let you read that for a minute, but you'll see that I've broken it up into the what was ENAV supposed to be, how, and more importantly, why were we doing this? Well, since then, a lot has changed, and at the outset, e-navigation was a bit of a captivating term, a buzzword, but it's now lost some of its impact. There are no new significant work proposals before the IMO, and even IOLA's e-navigation committee has modified its name somewhat to include information services and communications, thereby reflecting the actual work that the committee is doing. So the why and the how of e-navigation, in my view, still remain valid. But the what is turning out to be somewhat different. And I say that because when we started off the work on e-navigation, there were a number of projects and test beds that got underway. And they were all to do with things like sea traffic management, port collaborative decision making. In fact, the number of projects were so many that Ayala set up a website to capture testbed results. And on the right hand side, you will see an extract of just some of the testbeds that were reported to Ayala. But since 2006, when this work started off, much has changed in our world. We're hearing a lot about decarbonization. In fact, that is the theme of our conference. Climate change wasn't such a big thing. Increasing automation. And the work on supply chains and, and just-in-time arrivals. On the plus side, IMO has successfully completed some work on the design of navigation systems. Some of us might be familiar with the term S-mode. The formal title is far, far too long, but that work has been complete. But what remains is some globally agreed harmonized systems to do with communications and positioning. And of course, digital maritime services. To coincide with the World Aids to Navigation Day three years ago, my organization, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, released its strategy document, a photo of which you see on the screen. And you can download that for free on the website if you wish. Its contents are on the right-hand side, but the key element there is section four, which really looks at the emerging trends and drivers that will influence the provision of navigation services in our waters. What does that mean for industry? And more importantly, what will my organization's policy response be? Well, what about the future of navigation in a digital world? While this quote is somewhat tongue-in-cheek, there are, of course, many challenges ahead. And in the interests of time, I'll just elaborate on three. With the growing use of automation, we have to ask ourselves, how can we trust autonomous systems? And the short answer is transparency of inputs and outputs, 
the accuracy of outputs, and human-centered design. How do we deal with boredom and fatigue of the seafarer? Again, very simplistically, get the machines to do what machines are good at, and leave the humans to look at the big picture, reasoning in uncertainty, trying to pick up signals in the middle of noise, and the good old gut feeling. It's pleasing to see that IMO has embarked on some work to develop a goal-based instrument by 2025. But there are a number of challenges that remain with the introduction of automation. I've just listed three on the screen. Some of you seeing these two images will straight away identify the incident I'm going to talk about. And it's to do with an incident that took place 13 years ago when a bird strike after takeoff took off both the engines of an Airbus A320 aircraft on a domestic flight in the United States. The pilot had a tough decision to make, try and make it back to an airfield or crash land in the Hudson River. We all know what happened. 155 people were saved. And why am I telling you this? Because the captain of the aircraft, Captain Sully Sullenberger, had two quotes on automation. The first one simply underscores the need for experience. And the second one is relatively new. He talks about new kinds of errors coming in with automation, and that is something we need to be aware of. And this is also a somewhat concerning statement, which is when things are quiet, it can lower pilots' workload, but when things get busy, it can increase pilots' workload. So that is the paradox of cockpit automation. Turning our attention to the maritime sector and staying with automation, obviously ECTUS is the prime example and it is front and center of a lot of discussions that take place with maritime administrations and accident investigators. The two images on the, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, the first was a ship that broke into two. It managed to find the only reef for hundreds of miles in the middle of the Pacific. It planted itself on that and broke into two. The image on the bottom left was a government vessel, and one would like to think that their standards of training and watchkeeping were better. And the one on the right is, is about 10 years ago, and the English Channel, and you have to wonder how the Ectus allowed a route like that to be planned, much less executed. So I'd like to draw attention to a 2018 study by the United Kingdom and Denmark's accident investigating bodies when it was clear that there was a mismatch between the use of ECTUS on board currently and the intention of its original design and standards. The report emphasized the benefits of ECTUS and a number of challenges were identified but to me, the two things that were important is that ECTIS continues to be framed and audited in the context of paper charts, and that navigation training is still based on paper chart thinking. <clears throat> the second challenge is harmonization. And it is vital that the world has harmonized standards, which then support interoperability and enhance safety. Prior to 1977, for those of you that can't remember that far back, the world had about 30 different voyage systems. But it was thanks to IOLA's efforts at harmonization that the world now has a single maritime void system. In the context of digital maritime services, the Maritime Connectivity Consortium, or the MCC, has a key role to play in the harmonization of the various instances of MCP that are being established around the world. And there is an ILA recommendation that underscores the importance of implementing harmonized solutions. 
The third challenge is training and certification. IMO has the SDCW Convention 1978, as some of you may know, <clears throat> and it has indicated that it will begin a review of the convention and the 95 code next year. The review is so that the convention and the code continue to remain fit for purpose. And from a NAV safety point of view, the two statements in the review, or that, that sort of signal that a review is about to begin, is poor watchkeeping practices, and once again, the move from paper to electronic. There are, of course, a number of other reasons why the review is needed, not the least of which was the 2010 Manila Amendments, which identified a review in, in 10 years' time. So it is a bit overdue, to be honest. Um, the obvious other one is the introduction of autonomy and a number of other points on the screen. So what does navigation in a digital world really mean? Some of the elements of navigation in, in the future, and I'm repeating myself here, is the training, which is electronics first, not paper first. But then getting into more specifics, it's the exchange of voyage plans, and we can see standards. The previous speaker talked about this and a lot of things that can only be displayed in the electronic world. Two publications that I particularly like to point out, one is the, the British Admiralty's Principles of Navigation Manual, which is truly a contemporary and thorough presentation of best electronic practice, and then the International Chamber of Shipping's Bridge Procedures Guide. So to sum up, Navigation in a digital world, what would that look like ideally? It would be automation, all the various information flows that we, we, we are aware of and that we'll hear about in the next two days, and most importantly, the crew working together as one team. We've seen variations of, of this in BRM principles, but it's really important that each analyze prioritize information and support the other to ensure safe navigation. I'll leave you with two thoughts. One is the move from paper to digital. And the other one, perhaps, is more suited to our COVID times. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention.